Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Kate Lauman, social media consultant for SSM Health. Welcome to our Google Hangout on Air. Tonight we're talking about menopause, the process, the symptoms, and how you can help control some of the discomfort that comes along with it. Now during this chat, we would love to hear from you. You can email us your questions, our email address, ssm at ssmhc.com. You can also tweet your question to us. Just use the hashtag AskSSM or you can also post on our Facebook, um, also YouTube, Google Plus. Just search SSM Help. Now, as we answer your questions today, please keep in mind it's for informational purposes only. If you have questions about your own health, please speak with your own health care provider. Now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kate Endicott, Family Medicine and Women's Health with the SSM Medical Group. Dr. Endicott, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and be giving this talk. Um, so as a family physician, I do a lot of women's health, and so menopause is something that I deal with on a pretty regular basis. Um, hopefully during this talk, we'll talk a little bit about the symptoms, um, as well as what you can do to, to alleviate them. Full disclosure, I have not gone through menopause myself, but I, I can empathize with how distressing the symptoms can be. So this first slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about definitions of what menopause means. And I have to share a little story with you. I have had a number of patients, um, some of them in their 80s and 90s, when I asked them how old they were when they went through menopause, they said, oh, I never went through menopause because they never had the symptoms. But menopause is not related to the symptoms. It's all about when you had your last period. So the true diagnosis of menopause is when you've had 12 months in a row of no periods. Um, we call this premature if it happens before the age of 40. Uh, menopause is, is usually a natural process but can also be caused by surgery. So if you've had your ovaries taken out. Um, chemotherapy can sometimes send women into menopause just because it's the nature of how the drug works or radiation. Uh, perimenopause is the term we give to the years circling menopause. Um, and this is an important distinction because this is actually when women usually start to feel the hot flashes. And on average, it's about four years before that last menstrual period. So who does it affect? Why do we care? 50% of people, 100% of women, every single woman will go through this at some point. The average age in North America is 51. And so what are the symptoms? I probably don't have to describe um, the hot flushes to you. Most women do know what that means when it comes along with menopause. But for those of you who maybe haven't gone through this yet, a hot flash um, is a feeling of warmth. Um, women start to feel sweaty. They flush. And then immediately after, start to feel chills. Along with this, they can feel anxiety. Their heart can race. And frequently, these happen at night. These vasomotor symptoms have to do with how the blood vessels in your body control blood flow. Um, less commonly reported are the urogenital symptoms, such as vaginal dryness, a change in the discharge, itching, pain with intercourse, or a low sex drive. Um, along with this can also go mental changes, such as sadness, sometimes worsening depression if a patient is already struggling with that, um, decreased interest in the things they already like doing, and more sleeping problems. So you may be thinking, if you haven't gone through menopause, you're going to go through all of that. Um, hopefully not all of it, and not necessarily will you go through it, um, but probably some of it. The studies have shown that about 50 to 80 percent of the women in the United States do report having hot flashes. The urogenital symptoms are less common, 10 to 40 percent. Um, that second part there on the slide I put there because I, I think it's interesting how medicine can change from culture to culture. And so there's a couple statistics about how women feel menopause around the world. Interestingly, it's lowest in Asia. So what can you do about it? We're going to break the rest of this talk up into to four areas of, of, of treatment uh, approaches. The first being lifestyle modification. This is a lot of common sense type stuff. We'll get into the, the nitty gritty of hormone therapy and other medications that are not hormones, as well as herbal therapy, which I know a lot of you have questions about. Um, there's an asterisk by that for a reason. We'll come back to that. So this is a very busy slide um, that you don't really need to understand, but basically you just need to understand that your body has sensors that um, tell your brain whether or not you're experiencing uh, cold weather, hot weather, and then these sensors send signals up to your brain, which is where your hypothalamic thermostat is, that big green box, 
and your ba brain tells your body how to react after that. Do I need to uh, engage mechanisms to start sweating to cool down? Do I need to shiver to get hot? What happens in menopause is that thermostat box is actually narrowed compared to somebody who is not in menopause. And so it takes very, very little changes um, in a woman who's gone through menopause to, to have her body send off these signals, which is why a woman feels a hot flash when everyone else in the room kind of feels okay. So the first approach to treatment, as we talked about, is a lot of this um, common sense type stuff. So dressing in layers, if, especially as you're heading into spring and summer, we're going into graduation season, think about what environment you're going to be on. You're going to be inside, you're going to be outdoors, probably switching between the two. So wear layers, tank tops, cardigans, jackets, so that you can dress up and down to how your body is feeling. Um, a cold glass of water, it seems like a simple solution, but if, you're, if your body is feeling overwhelmed and hot and flushed, sometimes some ice water is all it takes to sort of get that temperature back down. Uh, many women report that their hot flashes are the most severe at nighttime, and so turning down the thermostat in the bedroom can be a simple fix. And then finally, looking for hot flash triggers. Now, admittedly, a lot of women will say that their hot flashes kind of come willy-nilly and there's not much they can do to prevent it, but some women will say, you know, I've noticed it more if I have a glass of wine or spicy food, so look out for those kinds of things because if you can avoid the hot flash in the first place, you'll be a little bit more comfortable. Um, as far as the vaginal discomfort goes, um, there's kind of two different types of, of products you can use. The Astroglide and the KY Jelly are more for lubricants for sexual activity. Replens is more of a day-to-day -day moisturizer just to help with some of the itching and discomfort. Um, there's also some literature out there that says that staying sexually active can help. I haven't actually seen any scientific evidence of this that's come across my desk, um, but the idea is, is that if you stay sexually active, you increase blood flow to the area and that can help with the dryness and discomfort. Paying attention to your mental and physical well-being. Again, these are sort of uh, common sense things, and these are things that I uh, encourage all of my patients to pay attention to, but they can have some um, real relevance in, in menopause. So practicing relaxation techniques, things like meditation, yoga, prayer, these can help with some of the mental changes that happen with menopause. Avoiding cigarette smoke, there is every reason to quit smoking if you're already smoking, but as it relates to menopause, Women who smoke can actually experience menopause at an earlier age. Um, tobacco can also increase your hot flashes. Uh, maintaining a healthy weight, again, a good idea to do for so many reasons, but in menopause, we know that obese women are more likely to have hot flashes, and they've actually shown that weight loss has been shown to improve how bad a woman experiences her hot flashes. So what about hormones? This is, this is the real nitty-gritty that I think a lot of people have questions about. We're going to talk a little bit about how hormones used to be used in the past, the study that kind of changed it all, and, and what the recommendations are now. So prior to 2002, when a woman went through menopause, it was pretty much standard practice for her doctor to start her on hormone replacement therapy right away. Um, we know that when you go through menopause, you're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, stroke, as well as osteoporosis. And we know that if we give women hormones, these, these um, risks are somewhat uh, alleviated. And so it makes good sense, we thought, to sort of to do that, to prevent women from having heart attacks and strokes. In 2002, this study right here, this Women's Health Initiative study was published and what they did was they compared women who were taking hormones to women who were taking a placebo pill. And they actually had to stop the study early because the women who were taking the hormones were experiencing heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots at a much higher rate of the placebo group that they said, you know, this study is not even safe for us to keep doing. At that point in time, the medical world kind of spun on its heels. We went from pretty much prescribing hormone therapy to everyone to saying, oh my gosh, this is such a dangerous medication, we can't give it to anyone. Since that time, we, we've, we've sort of um, relaxed in our knee-jerk rea reaction. Um, what's important to know about the study is that the women who were enrolled in it, on average, were around the age of 63, which is a full decade later than most women who go through menopause. And we know that just being age 63 versus age 50, you're already at higher risk of heart attack and stroke. Um, and so the recommendations actually say now that for the right woman in the right population, meaning she's 
just starting to go through menopause. She's in her late 40s, early 50s, um, and as long as she doesn't have any contraindications, if she's having moderate to severe hot flashes, it's probably safe to go ahead and do hormone replacement therapy at a small dose for a short period of time. So the types of hormone therapy we have available, there's a couple different delivery methods. There's skin options, the transdermal, where you can wear a patch, use a spray, a gel, or a cream. We've got pills, and there's also a vaginal ring or a cream. The benefit to the transdermal option is that um, it seems like that's associated with less strokes and blood clots, and so I think that's generally what most providers are, are doing if they opt for hormone therapy. The vaginal ring or cream is mainly used for women whose symptoms are, are primarily genital dryness. Um, the idea being is that you're putting the medication right where the symptoms are. There's still some absorption into the rest of the body, but not as much as if you were taking a pill. Uh, this is more of a, a shop talk kind of slide. So basically, women just need to know that if you've still got a uterus, you need to take an additional medication along with estrogen um, to decrease your risk of, of uterine cancer. If you've had your uterus taken out, you don't need that. Again, that's more for you to talk about with your doctor if you're considering hormone therapy. So who can take it and how long can we take it for? So the candidates for hormone replacement therapy, as I said earlier, you, we pretty much want to limit this to people who are having really bad symptoms. If, if your symptoms aren't that bad, it's probably not worth the risk. Um, again, we like the, the age range to be in the late 50s to early, uh, late 40s, I'm sorry, to early 50s. Um, getting into your late 50s, early 60s, again, that was the, the group in the study that had the problems. And then listed there are the conditions that will basically risk you out of being a candidate for hormone replacement. So you cannot have a history of breast cancer, heart disease, stroke, blood clots, any active liver disease, and you can't be at a high risk for any of these problems either. Um, most physicians are prescribing this for about two to three years, and the recommendations are really saying try to not do it more than five years. The good news is that for most women, the, the mean duration of symptoms is about five years. Unfortunately, there's still a small percentage of women who have reported symptoms for up to 10 years after the last menstrual period. So, ugh. Another option for women, if, if hormone replacement therapy isn't um, something that you are, are thinking about, is oral contraceptive pills. These are still hormones. They're actually a higher dose than the hormone replacement therapy. Um, they do work to relieve menopausal symptoms. Um, they also can provide contraception if you're still in that area of life where you're worried about getting pregnant. Um, just as an FYI, many women ask me, doctor, what, what's my chance of actually getting pregnant? So for women who are aged 45 to 49, it's, it's estimated that you have a 2 to 3 percent chance of still getting pregnant it falls to less than 1% after age 50. The other benefit to this is that they're, they're useful for controlling bleeding problems. And so um, one of the side effects of traditional hormone replacement therapy can be some breakthrough bleeding. That doesn't really happen with oral contraceptives. Bioidentical hormones. So I know, again, people probably have a lot of questions about these. So my frank opinion about the bioidentical hormones is that they're kind of a scam. We've got a screenshot here that I took just from um, Google Shopping that just shows if you type in menopausal relief, there are plenty of people wanting to sell you a product. There's also no shortage of celebrities who are also trying to make some money off of this. We've got Suzanne Somers, she looks great, and I didn't even know this, Martha Stewart also has um, some supplements that are available. So what these are, the bioidentical hormones, they are hormones that were extracted from plants like soy and they're, they're ground down into fine little capsules and they're sold in these bottles. And the, the pitch that's gone along with this is that people tend to think that they're safer because they're natural. The, the problem is, is that the same soy plants that produce these bioidentical hormones is the same place that we actually extract um, what we use in, in traditional hormone replacement therapy. It's just that in the traditional medication, these have been tested in the labs, the doses have been standardized, it's, it's run by the FDA, whereas these are nutritional supplements, and so we can't say for certain that you're getting the same dose from pill to pill. 
And so for that reason, these, these supplements might actually not even work as well as traditional hormone replacement therapy. You might have one pill that's got uh, more dose than the, the pill you're going to take tomorrow. Um, the other problem is that they're, they're not any safer than traditional hormone replacement therapy either. The idea is, is that these hormones are identical to what's already circulating in your body, and so they may reduce your symptoms, but they come with the same risk, heart attack, stroke, and all, all of those things. And so the working guidelines from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is that if you're going to go for hormone replacement therapy just to do the traditional kind, work with your doctor, get a prescription, these aren't really that safe. So this slide talks about some of the, um, the options that we have that are not hormone related. So these are, these are what we call sort of off-label use. The first um, column there is our antidepressant medications. I put just four of them on there, but um, just know that there's, there's actually a little bit of a longer list. These are the ones that have just been most rigorously tested and used. Paxil is the only one that's actually FDA approved for treatment of menopausal symptoms. The only problem with Paxil is that, unfortunately, for women who have breast cancer, Paxil is not an option because it kind of interferes with um, some of the chemotherapy medications. And so even though it's the one that's studied the most, and we know it works the best out of that list, it's not a great option for breast cancer patients. Um, the column to the right there, gabapentin is a medication that we use um, for seizures and as well for diabetic pain. Neither of these, these categories do doctors understand 100% how they work, but they have been studied. Um, gabapentin is a really nice medication, I would say, for women who primarily experience nighttime night sweats. One of the problems that we come across with when we give gabapentin to people with diabetes is that they're saying, you know, I'm feeling very sleepy, it's making me very drowsy. Well, that's kind of a wonderful side effect for a woman who's using it not for pain, but for hot flashes because it gets you to sleep a little better during the night, it might decrease the hot flash as well. Clonidine is the last one there, and that's a blood pressure medication. Um, that's sort of what I call the last line of, of all of these things because it's got a lot of side effects, but it's also an option if, if that's where you are. And finally, we're coming to the non-prescription therapy. I know a lot of people have questions about herbal treatment. Um, for those of you that don't recognize her, that's Samantha from Sex in the City, right when she was going through the change and she was using all sorts of uh, soy products and yams and topical things to try to alleviate her symptoms. Um, if you remember back to earlier in the talk when I had the little asterisk by the non-prescription therapy, the reason is, is that we just don't have a ton of good evidence to really recommend these routinely to our patients. Those listed right there are the, the main ones that I hear people talk about using. Um, for the next couple of slides, for the, for the purposes of the talk, we're basically going to talk about these, these supplements so that you have an idea of what they are and what they do, but um, just keep in the back of your mind that there's no recommendation to use any of these, these, these supplements actually, um, and I'm going to talk to you about them sort of in the level of their evidence. So the first group, this is about as good as it gets for the herbal therapy. And as good as it gets means that what if evidence there is out there for how well they work is inconsistent. So the things that are most commonly that are in this group are the isoflavones and the phytoestrogens. Um, these are uh, herbal therapies that are very, very similar to estrogen. Um, you can find them in soy, lentils, chickpeas. Um, the studies, the problems with these, with these two medications here, these two herbal supplements, is that the studies that we do have are done in, in very small numbers, so there's not a lot of women in these studies. They're done for a very short period of time, so two months, three months, they don't really carry them out many years, um, and the, the results just haven't shown that these medications do much more than placebo. But these, of all of the herbal therapies, these are the, probably the ones that are the best studied. So this is about as good as it gets for the herbal therapy. Again, we don't recommend all these. Um, these medications right here, these actually have no evidence. These have, have shown in, in trial after trial that when you compare these to placebo, that taking a placebo pill is about as good as doing any of these things. Um, keep in the back of your mind, however, that the, the placebo effect is, is actually about 30%. And so for a woman who is really just... Um, at the, at the end of a rope for symptoms, 
might be a good a good outcome. So again, these are commonly uh, I hear women talk about taking them. There is no evidence that these are actually any better than the placebo pill. And finally, um, the the category of things where we just need more research. Hypnosis is actually um, a technique that is looking promising. Um, the very small studies that we do have um, have shown good results, but they're just not in big enough numbers, um, and the techniques haven't been standardized enough for any physicians to recommend it routinely. So now that we're coming to the end of it, you're probably thinking, okay, doctor, thanks for all the information, but what do you think? Should I take hormones or not? Um, I, I still um, am on the bandwagon that I think that, um, you know, we've got a lot of options um, in terms of treatment for hot flashes. The lifestyle modification, I think that women really need to focus on maximizing doing those things. And then I generally use antidepressants as my first line um, if, if a woman is willing to do that. Um, I personally am just not willing to take on that risk of potentially causing a heart attack or stroke. But, you know, I'm not the one that has the hot flashes, and so I have a discussion with every patient and make sure that they understand the risk. And, and if their symptoms are so severe that um, they're just absolutely miserable in life, I do do hormone replacement therapy. But um, I generally advise people to try other options first. So to wrap up the talk, I just wanted to kind of give you all a uh, public service announcement about the other kinds of things you should be checking into when you're getting near menopause. And so as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we know that when women go through menopause, um, they're at higher risk for heart attacks and strokes, you're at higher risk for your, your bones thinning. Um, menopause itself doesn't necessarily put you at higher risk, but you still need to continue doing your normal breast cancer screening, your colorectal cancer screening, and your cervical cancer screening. And so most of these things are, are happening around the ages between 50 and 65. Um, and so these are the kinds of things you just want to make sure you're talking about your doctor with, make sure you're up to date on all of your screening tests. All right, really good information. Thank you so much, Dr. Endicott. And we already do have questions coming in, but I do want to remind everyone, if you have a question that you would like the doctor to answer this evening, you can see that email address at the bottom of your screen. It's asksm at ssmhc.com. All right, let's get right into the questions. And I'm not even surprised by this first question. But um, Cindy writes in wanting to know, how do you stop the hot flashes and night sweats? The hot flashes and night sweats. So I think we, we talked on um, a couple of those medications. Um, you know, estrogen, the estrogen replacement, it works the best. It really is the best thing. And so if your symptoms are terrible and really just distressing your life, talk to your doctor. That might be the first line for you. If your symptoms are just at nighttime, the gabapentin that I mentioned might be your best option because it, it, it you can take it just before you go to bed at night. It helps your sleep a little bit and it will reduce the hot flashes that you're experiencing at nighttime. A couple times in your presentation you talked about um, the severity of those hot flashes or the symptoms in general. When you talk with your patients, is it more about the frequency or more about the severity of an individual episode or a mixture of both? It can be both and I've, I've heard both from women. I've heard women say, listen, I don't have that many, but when I do, my clothes are soaked. I have to bring a change of clothes. People are staring at me. It's embarrassing. If you're having that happen once a day, that's pretty distressing. Um, you know, equally distressing, I think, would have something not that severe, but if you're sweating a lot and it's happening multiple times a day every day, you know, both are, both are pretty severe in my opinion. Another question coming in, um, wanting to know, why before a hot flash does it feel like there could be needles sticking you or sometimes just a little discomfort? I, you know, I don't have the exact scientific answer for this, but I think what is happening is that when you're having a, um, when you're having a hot flash, it's because your your blood vessels are responding to chemicals in your body that are telling your body, oh, we need to send more blood. So if you think about um, just your hand falling asleep is a good example. Whenever you shake your hand out, you, those pin, pins and needles start to go away. It's the same kind of concept. Whenever there's a lack of blood flow or an increase of blood flow, you have sensations um, that, that mimic that. That makes absolute sense. 
Um, another question coming in saying that I started having symptoms in January, so just a few months now. She spoke with her doctor, she did the blood test, and it actually came back that she was postmenopausal. She wasn't sleeping well, um, a lot of hot flashes. She started taking um, some supplements, vitamin E, a couple others that helped. She cut back on those, and most of the symptoms are at bay except for the tiredness. Um, extreme tiredness, sluggish, and no energy. That is still there. Any advice for just those symptoms? So I would advise her to talk to her doctor a little bit more and make sure that the um, that menopause is the actual problem. It's very possible that that's sort of to blame for those symptoms, but um, it, it those could also be depression. It could also be mood changes. And as we know, menopause can be associated with causing some mood changes. Um, I generally have my patients, again, focus on those lifestyle modifications. If, if the sluggishness seems to be the main problem, making sure you're getting regular exercise, making sure you've got good sleep hygiene, you're getting eight hours a night, you're eating nutritious foods. You know, all of those things are kind of like, yeah, yeah, doctor, we know. But when you take them in combination and you, and you look at all of those healthy practices, um, if a patient's not kind of maximizing all of those, it's amazing how crummy you can feel and how much better you can feel um, when you do take efforts to sort of maximize those lifestyle changes. Absolutely. It can make a huge impact. Another question coming in, um, a woman with breast cancer um, was told that she needs to be very careful about what she can take. She says she's currently taking, and I could say this completely wrong, venlafaxine, about 75 milligrams for hot flashes, and it's not helping. What else could she potentially take right. for hot flashes? So venlafaxine is the effexor. That was that second medication in the antidepressant list, um, also very commonly used for hot flashes. Um, Antidepressants are a little tricky, and the reason there are so many on the market is because there's no one-fits-all for anybody. Um, even when we're using them in traditional sense for depression, sometimes it takes trial and error in figuring out what medication works for you. And so I would encourage her to go down the list and try the other two medications. Perhaps she should be the candidate for clonidine or gabapentin. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, a couple of drugs I didn't even put on that list that are less studied, but when you're really trying to find something that works, there's, she's still got a few options she can try. Got it. Another woman wrote in saying she's 52 years old and instead of periods getting further apart, they're actually happening more frequently. For the past year, most months, the periods were only two weeks apart, also some spotting. Um, now taking iron for anemia, is this something that you've seen happen before menopause? Yes, yeah, so the, the normal menopausal pattern, I would say for you know 90 or more so percent of women, is that your periods actually space out before they stop altogether. So women will notice, I skipped a month, I skipped two months, and this can take a while. Women can be in that perimenopause time for four years where they're sort of skipping periods but they haven't gone that full 12 months. There's a very, very small percentage of women who actually have more periods as opposed to less. The problem with this is that even though it might be part of normal menopause, we also can't distinguish this from abnormal bleeding that could be associated with something like uh, endometrial cancer um, or like an endometrial polyp. And so she should definitely talk to her doctor about this um, because it, it can be normal in a very small percentage of women, but she wants to be checked out and make sure there's not something more serious going on. That's great advice. Um, you talked about that number 12, that being the number of months of missed periods. Um, is that a always rule or is it a case by case with some women? That is the always rule. That is the always rule. Um, there are some special situations where we anticipate menopause. Um, so, for example, women who are taking chemotherapy that we know may induce periods. Um, if, if a woman has gone six months without a period and we know she's taking a medication, we can say most likely you're heading into menopause because we gave you this medication and we, and we know it will happen. But 12 months is the rule. And so that's why I said that that perimenopause time Women can really think, I'm starting to go through menopause, then go six, seven months, and then whoop, they've got a period. So it starts over. It has to be 12 consecutive months. Now, you said something about 10 years during your presentation, People, that some people will have symptoms for 10 years. That's right. not the one, though, right? 
That is a small percentage. It's it's estimated it being about a third of women, so thirty percent. So wow. it's not it's not small change, but it's it's the average woman really only experiences usually for about five years or so. As I mentioned, I like I said, I've had patients who have had zero symptoms, and so uh, there's really no way to know sort of what a woman's course will be. I wanted to go back a minute. Um, the other thing that's important to mention about the, the bleeding, um, so we do define 12 months as menopause. If a woman experiences any bleeding after that 12 months, so she's already considered menopause, also abnormal and she should see her doctor for that. Okay, that's good to note. What can you tell um, someone writing in wanting to know about natural remedies that can be used for menopause symptoms while on oral chemotherapy medicines? So the natural therapies, I, I pretty much summed it up in the talk. The evidence is just really not there for us to recommend um, much of the herbal therapies. Um, I, I would be cautious of some of these things who are, are trying to get your money, you know. Um, I would have that patient talk to her doctor because most oncologists are pretty familiar with um, menopause due to chemotherapy and she may need to try some of those other uh, prescription medications that we have available. Have you ever seen any dietary changes work to decrease hot flashes? I haven't. I do know that, um, so in, in um, again, p women often will try to increase like their yam intake, lentils, chickpeas, soy. These are the things that have some of those phytoestrogens. And again, the evidence just really isn't there to show that there's going to be any significant benefit. Um, I'm not against someone trying those things. Those are all pretty healthy options. Uh, but I don't think that there's any scientific evidence to show that they're that useful. Um, what about another question coming in? Um, are menopausal women more at risk for heart attacks and for strokes? They absolutely are. And so it's, it's kind of a, um, for two reasons. One is just simply by age. Your risk for heart attack and stroke goes up with every year that you're aging. Um, uh, estrogen also acts as having some cardio protection, at least that's what we thought when we were giving women hormone replacement therapy left and right before 2002. Um, we definitely know that giving those hormones back don't necessarily protect your heart. They actually you're increased a risk of heart attack and stroke, but something about that menopausal change puts you at higher risk. And it might not be exactly estrogen, it might be a coincidence of something else going on, but women, once they go through menopause, are at higher risk of heart attack and stroke. Any prevention tips that you could share with people in regards to heart attack and stroke? Yeah, so some of the things I mentioned before, just making sure you're keeping a healthy weight, um, exercising on a regular basis. Most people, when they think about exercise, they think, oh, I need to go to the gym and run a marathon. The exercise that you need to get for prevention is really minimal. If you can walk for 20 to 30 minutes most days of the week, and I usually tell people to get their exertion level up to a point where they can talk to somebody but uh, are unable to sing. So if you're just doing a walking program, that can be extremely beneficial. Um, so keeping a healthy weight, exercising regularly, talking to your doctor about whether or not you're a candidate for aspirin for prevention as well. Okay. How long does the entire menopausal transition take? Hopefully no more than 10 years. 10 years, like I said, 10 years was that 30%. That's about the longest that I've heard. Um, and so if you, if you factor in everything, perimenopause starting four years before, plus a possible 10 years of symptoms, you're looking at about 15 years. Okay. Hopefully not that long. That's sort of the extremes of the spectrum. Yeah, I hope not either. Um, <laughs> a woman writing in, how do I deal with weight gain after surgically induced menopause due to breast cancer? She says she's tried several options to lose weight. Nothing's working. Um, anything else she could try and wondering if maybe it could be some of the medications hindering the weight loss success. It's absolutely possible. Um, I, without knowing the specifics of what's going on with her, uh, my general recommendations still stand just to make sure that you're maximizing your exercise efforts. I take a good hard look at her at her diet. You know, um, many of us think that we're eating a healthy diet, but when you jot the calories down and look at where the calories are coming from, it's not that beneficial after all. Um, we do have nutritionists here at St. Mary's that I will often send patients to because um, many patients think, oh, I'm, I'm eating healthy, but when you break it down and look at what they're actually consuming, 
they probably could be making some better choices. So she should talk to her doctor about the medications and see if um, the weight gain is a possible side effect. If she's tried a lot of options, if she's tried the nutrition and the exercise and she's still having issues, um, we also do have a weight loss center that I've referred people to for um, prescription management as well as uh, surgery in cases where, where um, it's really a, a life-threatening issue. It seems like it can really be a team effort with the various physicians and, like you said, um, dietitian thrown into the mix. Do you see that a lot with a lot of these women coming in? I do. I mean, d diet is um, its part of our everyday life. It's such a tricky thing. You know, as Americans, we're battling obesity left and right. Um, we're, we're leading very busy lives. And then, you know, you throw menopause on top of things. You get used to one thing, and you're suddenly thrown totally off your schedule and off kilter. Um, a question coming in talking about how you mentioned the 12 months of no period. Um, she was wanting to know she isn't getting a period because of a birth control option. Um, how is she going to determine if she's then in menopause? So there's actually a blood test that you can, can take. Um, there's certain hormone levels that we can measure if there's any question if a woman's gone through menopause. And so I'll frequently do that if a woman's looking at getting off birth control, but she wants to make sure she's actually gone through menopause. You can have her doctor check some blood work and see if it's safe to stop the birth control. Okay. Um, someone writing in, please discuss options for hormone replacement, natural versus synthetic, and the pros and cons, and plus um, side effects. Do you see any side effects? Sure. So I would go back to if you're if you're considering hormone replacement therapy, I would talk to your doctor. I would do the prescription version. Those bioidentical hormones, they're not any safer. They probably don't work as well. Um, and and side effect wise, it's pretty much the same because they are bioidentical hormones. Um, I would say the biggest side effect that women experience when they have hormone replacement therapy are some of those menstrual irregularities. Um, another another woman writing in, my mother claims she went through menopause for a decade. <laughs> um, is that possible? And if so, is that an indication of what she has to look forward to? Um, that is a very good question. I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that have shown that there's a direct correlation between mothers and daughters and, and the symptoms they experience. I, in my own practice, will frequently ask women when their mothers went through menopause to get an idea. I can't tell you whether or not it's scientifically based. <laughs> yeah. And I do want to let people know we do have time for a few more questions. So if you are watching out there and you do have a question that you would like Dr. Endicott to answer, you can go ahead and email that in, our email address tonight, askssm at ssmhc.com. Another question coming in, how long are you comfortable leaving a woman on oral contraceptives and can a woman go through menopause while being on those? She absolutely can. The oral contraceptives have nothing to do with your endogenous estrogen uh, production. That comes from your ovaries. Menopause is the natural um, waning of those ovaries producing estrogen. So that will happen whether you're taking an oral contraceptive pill or not. Um, and the way you would know, like I mentioned earlier, would be that blood test. And so if you're, if you're worried about um, whether or not you're still able to get pregnant and when to come off, um, that blood test can be helpful. Um, I would say that for most women, since the average age of menopause is 51, it's not unreasonable to start checking that level at 50 or so and see if it's safe to come off the birth control pills. You know, in America, with the average age of a woman having their, her first baby increasing over the past few decades, do you see has that age of menopause changed, the average age of menopause? I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I know that childbearing has no effect on when you go through menopause. It doesn't matter if you have any children, if you have 10 children, when you have them. We have seen that the average age of um, girls first getting their periods has been going down. There's a lot of discussion as to why that's happening. It's still in scientific debate. I actually don't have the answer. I don't know if menopause has been getting later or not. I, I, I want to say that it's been around age 54 um, for a long time. Um, now, you see women, obviously, of all ages. Is there anything that you tell, you know, some of those younger patients of yours who are, you know, in their childbearing years and having babies, is there anything you tell them um, how to either minimize the impact of menopause coming later in their life or even to just prepare them for the menopausal transition? 
Most of my young women have no idea that menopause is <laughs> going to happen. It is not even on their radar at all. It's not till women usually get to their childbearing age um, and they've, you know, they've got teenagers, older kids that they're starting to think about it. And, and most women are already asking me about it. I, I rarely have to bring it up that women have lots of questions about this process. It's, I mean, in some ways it's very much like talking to, you know, your 11 or 12 year old, someone who's going through a transition who's about to start having periods, what's this new frontier going to be like? It's kind of the same concept. Yeah, absolutely. Any educational resources out there that sometimes you, um, you tell people about? I don't have any particular um, one site that I go to, I just tell people to be cautious with the educational materials that they seek out. And so, reputable places like the Mayo Clinic, anything that's going to come from a hospital website, um, WebMD tends to be okay. I tell people to stay away from chat boards or blogs where people are talking about their situation because most of those cases are, uh, you know, you're not seeing the bigger picture. And so, you want to make sure the information you're getting is unbiased um, and comes from a reputable source. Um, last question coming in, and this is almost a primary care question, but um, you know, you did talk about some, as a woman obviously getting older, other risk factors in her life. Um, how often are you hoping to see a woman in your office, um, whether it's for women's health or family practice? If, if a woman has zero medical problems, is not taking any medications, I still think she should come in for a yearly check. Check your blood pressure, make sure her physical exam is still okay, make sure she's up to date on that list of, of screening tests that I talked about. For women who have medical problems, it varies um, every three months, every six months, kind of depending on what the condition is. But for a totally healthy person, at least once a year, like I said, that blood pressure check is one of the most important things we do um, at their physical. All right. Well, great information. That was our last question for this evening. Thank you so much to everyone who sent in all your questions. And thank you, of course, to Dr. Endicott for sharing all of this extremely valuable information. And if you're looking for more information or providers in your area, please visit our website, ssmhealth.com live. Thanks for tuning in tonight, and we'll see you soon.